Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to Kerber Rowe's overview of the Consolidation Appropriations Act of 2021. We are excited you could all be here with us today to learn more about the various topics that will be covered. My name is Christopher Olson, and I am a senior manager at Kerber Rose. I've worked for Kerber Rose for the last little over two years now, and my spe I specialize in construction and real estate, manufacturing, and retail industries. And this is Tony Powers, a shareholder in charge of the Retirement Plan Division. I've worked for Kerber Rose since uh, 2017. Um, and specialize in group retirement plans, um, as well as help our uh, wealth management team on the individual side. And today we'll be covering an overview of the Consolidations Appropriations Act of 2021. Now, without further ado, let's begin the presentation. Today's topics will include the following. President Biden's tax policy, the Consolidation Appropriate Act of 2021, and the, and the provisions within the Consolidation Appropriations Act, such as the Paycheck Protection Program, the Employee Retention Credit, the Shuttered Venues Operations, Economic Recovery Payments, other provisions within the Act, and finally, retirement plans. President Biden's tax plan. Now, this was not part of the Consolidations Appropriations Act, but it is good to kind of get an understanding or an overview of what has been or likely discussed in the last three months. So give me an understanding of the individual plan. Currently, um, President Biden's plan is to increase the ordinary tax rate to 39.6%. Now, prior to the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, or the TCGA, the top rate for wages and interest, business income, it was 39.6%. And as you know, the current rate for the last couple of years is set at 37%. Now, who would that apply to? It's for right now, we're looking at potentially singles, potentially head of households, roughly income starting around $524,000. Married, that rate would be around, or that income would be around $630,000. In addition to that rate increase, there are some other increases that Biden has planned for, such as the payroll tax increase. So currently, as everyone knows, we have social security tax on the first $137,000. That's around 12.4%. The employee pays a portion and the employer pays a portion. Under the president's plan, there would be an additional 12.4% on wages or self-employment income in excess of $400,000. Now the question would be is 400,000 for single, 400,000 for married, what does that mean? Currently we don't know. So we'll just have to stay tuned as we know more information you know, throughout the year. Capital gains. Income or taxable income for capital gains in excess of a million dollars, the top rate of 39.6, that's that top rate for ordinary income, that would apply for long term capital gains as well as qualified dividends. If your income is below 1 million, that top rate would not be applicable. Now, this dreaded qualified business income or QBI is known to the tax world. Currently, there's 20% deduction on your qualified trade or business income. Under President Biden's tax plan, he would eliminate that 20% shave or cutoff for people who have income or taxpayers with income over $400,000. And two, you have questions would be, well, what is that 400,000 for single, head of household, married? That still has yet to be determined. Itemized deductions higher earning taxpayers, they would bring, President Biden would bring back the cap at 
So if you're roughly around in the highest tax bracket, you know, such as you know your expense or your charity, so your you know, kind of interest, property taxes, you know, you you would still be you would be capped at 20 percent. You wouldn't get all of it, so that's kind of where the cap is. This this cap was around prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So you probably have seen this, or maybe your tax advisor or trusted advisor, like I said, this would come back into, into play. There was also a discussion of retirement. And just kind of give you an idea, the idea would be to kind of have a, a, a level playing field or some depending on your income, it doesn't. It wouldn't matter if you made three hundred or thirty thousand. And in in this example I have here, if they made a contribution of a thousand dollars, there'd be a twenty six percent credit, a refundable credit. And let's see, as well as tax credits, you know, Biden would like to expand the earned income credit, the child tax credit, as well as the dependent care credit. The estate tax. President Biden has proposed an elimination of the step up in basis upon death. And actually at the end of this, you'd say death is now a realization event. Currently, somebody who passes on the step up in basis on death you know, preserves or I guess you know transfers over to the to the heirs. So it would be a big change, big change going forward if this provision would come to fruition. As well as the exemption, there'd be a reduction of 3.5 million. And then finally, a maximum tax rate increased to 45%. Of course, we can't re uh, forget about corporates. Uh, currently, we're at 21%. The proposal would be jumping to 28%. And then for those Amazon, because it's like an Amazon tax, but those Amazon companies of the world with book income in excess of 100 million, there would be, so let's say, a minimum tax of 15%. Some other potential proposals, offshore tax penalty, moving jobs out of the United States to other countries, as well as a potential made in America tax credit. Now, just to, before everyone, after this call, talk to your advisor. These are just nothing set in stone with President Biden's plan. So just be aware of that. All right, the Consolidation Appropriations Act. As you know, this was signed back on December 27th, not too long ago. We're actually approaching it uh, four weeks ago. It's around a 900 billion COVID relief and additional spending for the, fisc for the government fiscal year ending by September 30th. What's all included and what we'll cover today, Paycheck Protection Program, the Employee Retention Credit. We'll talk about the Economic Recovery Payments, and there's some, and some plenty other provisions in there. The Protect Paycheck Protection Program, big change. The biggest change right now, you could say, is the PPP expenses are now tax deductible. After the CARES Act was signed, say around May of 2020. The Treasury, U.S. Department of Treasury position, let's say, contradicted Congress's intent. So around May and then it was and as well as November guidance, what the Treasury said is those PPP expenses paid with forgiven covered loans, hey, they're non-deductible. Now, in order for that to get fixed, legislation would have been enacted, and that actually happened on December 27th. So now Clarification is those PPP loan proceeds are now, let's say, those expenses on forgiven loans are deductible. And that would be for retroactive application. You know, your first round loans, as well as if you do apply and get forgiven for your second draw loans, or what we would call PPP2. Now, lastly on this slide, what about Wisconsin's position? As of today, Wisconsin's is their position is those PPP expenses, actually they're not deductible. They're, they're kind of going with the Treasury's guidance before the legislation passed last month. 
So just be aware, you know, we were we were not expecting this aside from the Wisconsin Department of Revenue or the lawmaker. So just be aware when you get to planning and you know, maybe talk to your advisor like I, I just heard Wisconsin is not allowing the expenses for PPP and currently that is what it's at. We'll keep you updated if we find out more information. Currently, as I know, lawmakers, Wisconsin lawmakers are still in discussion right now about what to do. So, and you said, we'll just keep you updated once we know more. Simplified loan forgiveness under the new legislation. PPP loans under $150,000. It used to be under 50,000. Now they upped it to 150. In addition, they expanded some covered costs, these non-payroll costs, and we'll discuss that in the next slide. Now the SBA also has from December 27, 24 days to establish a one page application for say round two, and they already did. The applications just came out not too long ago, actually last week. In addition, they, they did say they have employment records, if you got the forgiveness, you should re you have to record retain those for four years. Now your other records, those non payroll costs, if you if you had those and were included in your payroll in your forgiveness application, those records retain for three years. Now these four additional covered costs: covered operation expenditures, property damage, supplier costs, worker protection equipment. These four additional categories are now part of you know, round one loans and now round two. Now I say round one loans, you'd be like, well, I already have spent it. Potentially you could go back if you haven't filed yet for forgiveness and received SBA ex a paid in full letter, but you could potentially go back and apply these expenditures to round one. But just to give you an idea, there are new categories for the 40%, the non-payroll cost that can be used. The cover period flexibility. The new legislation now allows flexibility in selecting your cover period. Before, it used to be either eight weeks or 24 weeks, but nothing in between. Now you have the flexibility to choose the within that eight weeks or 24 weeks. So. In, could be 12 weeks, could be 13 weeks, just a little more flexibility for the borrowers. The 60% still remains the same for payroll. So if you got a $100,000 PPP loan, let's say round two, you still need to spend at least 60% for, for forgiveness eligibility. As well as the economic injury disaster loan, that advance that you may have received last, for, um, last year, it was originally set at $10,000 and so forth. Either way, it came out that it, that advance was gonna be taxable. Well, the legislation said, nope, it's not gonna be taxable. And so just to, just to clear up things. Some of the big changes in the new, in the Paycheck Protection Program is for farmers and ranchers. When you originally filed for your forgiveness, you were taking net income, you know, gross income, less your expenses. And then that's what determined how you, if you have, you're eligible or how much you can get for your round one money. And this could be for round two. Well, now the legislation changed that calculation. And whereas let's say if you have no employees, you have a schedule F, it's based on gross income. So you potentially could go back to round one, get some round, you know, round one money and use the new calculation to grow, to get the maximum amount. So in this case, 100,000 is the max, divide by 12 at two and a half, you could potentially get 20,833. Now this is only applicable if you have not yet filed the SBA forgiveness application and received forgiveness. And unfortunately, the timing may not always work because we were already submitting applications, forgiveness applications, well before this legislation passed. Fortunately, if you already got that SBA letter, you can't go back to the first round. Now you can apply this procedure, this calculation for round two.
seasonal employers as well. They changed the calculation. Won't go too much into detail here because we do have a few more other topics to discuss. But just to give you an idea, this slide will it, it, they changed the definition. And so now you can base your loan amounts, the payroll costs at any 12 week period between February 15th of 19 through February 15th of 20. Due date, the due date to apply for second draw loans and if you want to go if and for first initial loans is March 31st. Now I say first initial is let's say you were you decided I don't want to take a chance and file for round one. It looks too good to be true. I just didn't do it. You can now go back and file for an initial loan, an initial loan to get this PPP and you have until March 31st. Now this this new legislation also expands the eligibility include 501c6 organizations and all those are like your leagues, chamber of commerce and so forth. Nonprofits, you know, that are destination marketing organizations. Now you do have to be careful about lobbying activities, so just be cautious if, if you have lobbying receipts in excess of 15% you definitely want to reach out to your trusted advisor just to get an understanding from the eligibility side. Now the second draw loans, round two loans or PPP2, they're, they're typically, they're generally available for the hardest hit small businesses. You first have to have 300 or few employees. You, you must record some 25% reduction in gross receipts in any quarter in 2020 as, and compare that same quarter to the to the 19 quarter. And I have a sl the next slide for some different variations. And the max loan is $2 million. The first loan, the first draw loan is maxed at 10 million. The second draw loan is maxed at two. And finally, if you did get the first draw loan money, you have to will use or have used the first round money before you before the disbursement date of the second draw loan proceeds. Here's a quick chart of the second draw loans. This quarter comparison at 25% reduction requirement. So if you were in operations in all of 2019, say the full year, you compare any quarter of 2020 and you compare that to the corresponding quarter in 2019. So quarter two, from 2020, a calendar quarter of 2020 compared to the calendar quarter 2019. Now, if you were, let's say, if you were in, you were L trader business and you were in quarter three and quarter four, that's when you were operations. You can compare any quarter in 2020 to either quarter three or quarter four of 19 and so forth. So, because quarter four, or maybe you didn't start until January 1st of 20. So then you would compare quarter one of 2020 to either quarter two, quarter three, or quarter four of 2020. And that that's what would be your 25% reduction comparison. Now in this legislation, they also have the opportunity for do over provisions. So if you were a borrower that returned all Maybe all of it, you know, you applied, you got accepted, you know, I, you know, you're going to get a hundred grand, but you're like, no, I don't want it. Just, I got approved, but I just, I'm not taking it. You can go back and get that a hundred thousand dollars. Or what if you return maybe 70% of that hundred grand? Can I get the 30%? And yes, you can. The, the key here is you, for that, that second scenario, if you only accepted 70%, you you must not, you, the forgiveness part, you know, the first round, you you have, you should not have done that yet, I guess. The point is, you can't have a received ex forgiveness. And if you did, you can't then go back and get that 30%. So the key is just, it's always before the forgiveness. Otherwise, it just won't work. Now, the mod, there's some modifications to the payroll costs under the new legislation. Like I said, I, as I mentioned earlier, a 60% requirement, there was no change. 
You got to spend 60%. But they did add group insurance payments as payroll costs now, such as group life, disability, vision, dental insurance. Now you can actually go back to first round and increase that loan to, to include that, but only if you haven't received forgiveness. You know, it, your forgiveness application has yet been received or accepted by the SBA. Like I said, once you received forgiveness for your first draw loan, it, pretty much you can't go back and try to change it. This employee retention credit, the CRC, we did, we'll talk about it later, but what the CARES Act said, this is back in March, if you were received a PPP loan, you were not eligible for the employee retention credit. Well, now this, the Consolidation Appropriations Act changed that. So now the benefit, the borrower can now claim both the PPP and the ERC. The key is you can't take the payroll cost for both. So we'll talk about that more later. Economic injury disaster loan, that EIDL. You know, the EIDL was a reduction of your PPP loan. Well, the, the legislation eliminated that rule, and so now it's not, not a reduction. And potentially, that it was a $10,000. And if you already filed for forgiveness, you may you want to talk to your advisor and look at that. But the idea here that if it if you filed for forgiveness and you, you reduced your PPP loan by the EIDL, the SBA is going to come back and give you that money. So supposedly they're going to do that and then the lender will contact you. So before, you know, you want to look at your forgiveness application and just see how that EIDL, if you got one, how that was treated. And I want to just mention Wisconsin's position. They're going to treat that as a, a taxable event. Federally is different. Federally, there's not taxable. It's, it's like, a, like a freebie. Wisconsin is not the same as of now. Gross receipts for that 25% reduction, comparing quarter to quarter, all for, pretty much all revenue is whatever form received or accrued based on your entity's accounting method. Sales of products, services, interest, dividends, rents, royalties, and so on, reduced by your returns and allowances. Now, one thing for sure to, to note is if you have forgiveness proceeds in your in your income, those forgiveness proceeds is not going to be counted toward this comparison. So you would exclude those forgiveness proceeds in your gross receipts comparison from quarter to quarter. Now the second draw loans, the calculating and the decline in receipts, they, the SBA does provide you an alternative approach. Instead of comparing quarter by quarter, you can take the actual tax return for 2019 and compare it to 2020. Now you have to be in operation in all four quarters of 2019, a calendar year, calendar year quarters. Now you don't like, the question is, well, 2020, we haven't even filed yet. Might have to, draft up a 2020 if you wanted to take this alternative approach. Now documentation is going to be needed for this to, to get this uh, second draw loan. For loans over 150,000 in at the initial application you have to supply documentation that quarter by quarter comparison or you're going to use that tax return comparison if you were in all operations all four quarters. Now for loans under 150 the time you file the application is not needed, but at the time of forgiveness application, you will need that documentation. So either way, loans over or under 150,000, you're going to need this documentation that, that recognizes that 25% reduction. So the maximum loan is 2 million. You can just see, kind of see here. I do want to point out that if you're a restaurant or hotel, and you have a, a code, this NAICS code that starts with 72, you can use three and a half months of average payroll costs. Documentation is still the same for the first draw loans. Now I do want to point out if you have round one money and you're like, I want round two and I qualify, you can use 2019 payroll figures and if you use the same lender, you don't have to submit some additional information. 
there's a new form out there, your your lender will have it. Talk to your, you know, also your trusted advisor to see how this is, but this is a new form, the 2483-3D. This is just kind of an overview of the first draw loans, who's eligible. Now there are some businesses that are not eligible. You know, if you're permanently closed, can't apply. Or if your business was not in operation on February 15th, 2020, you cannot, um, you can't apply. Lobbying organizations, household employers, publicly traded businesses, as well as entities affiliated with the People's Republic of China. This is just like a, a key takeaway. The next two slides on the changes to the PPP. We'll just continue on with the amount of time we have left. I do want to point out what the, the Wisconsin treatment again. I had I did mention it on a few slides, but the Wisconsin treatment, Wisconsin does not conform to federal. So if you have round one expenses, you have you're going to have to treat those as of today as non-deductible expenses on your 2020 returns. Now, why is that? You know, according to the to the Wisconsin lawmakers, there's potential lost revenue of around $450 million probably why they're looking at that. So if you have questions, you know, like why is this, you know, definitely contact your local Wisconsin lawmaker or lawmakers and express your opinion on this. So we're all in grants too as well, the, the grants that you got from the state, those are taxable for both federal and Wisconsin. You know, the, the restaurant all in grant or other type of a state grants, those are taxable. Employee retention credit. Kind of a quick overview. The CARES Act, like I said, I mentioned earlier, you can only take the PPP or the ERC, but not both. But now the new legislation says you can do both. But one catch, you can't use the same wages for the for both provisions. Now significant changes from the CAA, the, the, the legislation that was signed last last month. It's a payroll tax credit. It's not a loan, it's a payroll tax credit, different from the PPP. Can now be applied retroactive for PPP borrowers, you know, the round one, as well as round two. There is the credit itself originally was 50% per employee for the for the whole year, up to $10,000 of qualified wages, so $5,000 per person. That didn't really change for 2020, the, the new legislation extended the re employee retention credit for the first two quarters of 2021. And they did change a little, they did, they did change the credit to 70% per employee per quarter. So instead of 50%, like it was in 2020, it's 70% per quarter up to $10,000. So 7,000 for employee A would be eligible if they got paid 20 grand in two quarters or 10 and 10, a potential $14,000 credit for quarter one and quarter two of 2021. I do want to, I'm going to just continue to point out that you can't take the same wages for that employee and use it for PPP round two money or even round one if you didn't. So this is just an example how that calculation works. Pretty easy. This is just an overview of the employee retention credit for 2020. Like I said, we have the employee retention credit of 2020. And we also have the employee retention credit of 2021. Both very similar, but there are some differences. This will, this next two slides will, will point out the differences between the 2020 and 2021. The big one here is the wages are limited to 10,000 per employee for the year. So a max credit for one employee for 2020 is $5,000. As well as for, just to point out that it was for wages paid to employees after March 12, 2020 through the end of 2020. Now there is a gross receipts test. Now, how do you qualify? You could either be, maybe your operation was fully suspended because of a government order? Or what about partially suspended? 
we'll kind of cover that some examples of partially suspended. There's some gray area there, but we'll still we'll still cover it. Or what about your gross receipts? You know, you're comparing a quarter again to the previous quarter, and were they less than 50%? If so, then you qualify for that quarter up up until the point where your gross receipts are 80% of the same quarter from the prior year. The 2021 credit, just kind of point out some differences here. Instead of 50% of wages, it's 70% of wages paid. And then the gross receipts test, instead of the less than 50%, it's an 80% or a 20% reduction when you compare the 2021 quarter to the same quarter in 2019. So yes, I did say 2021. So if, you know this is likely going to be when you when you look at it in April when you file your quarterly payroll reports. So after the quarter one of 2021, you compare that quarter and compare it to the same quarter in 2019. And if you see a 20% or more reduction in gross receipts, you would then be eligible for the employee retention credit. Now also per employee per quarter max or 7,000 per employee. Partially or fully suspended operations. Now the IRS does have facts or FAQs addressing. What they are looking at is how was your business limited by any government mandate? Was there you know, like a state order, a federal order? How did they limit your travel, group meetings, the impact to your operations? That could include your hours of operations. You know, you were normally open to five, but the government says, you know what, you can. You have to shut down by three. You know, like I said, not every business, it's this partially or fully suspended operations. Every client will be different, every business. So you do need to talk to your trusted advisor to determine if you qualify. So before you start doing the calculations, like do I qualify for the 2020 employee retention credit? You do want to address a partially suspended operation. Now, if you're fully, I mean, you weren't open, clearly you qualify, but if you're partially, we have to further look into that. This is just some more information that we're finding. So the next slide will be some examples. Let's say if you had a car dealership, you're open for business, you know your essential business. Government didn't shut you down, but your customers were under a stay at home order. That caused decline in your sales. Do you qualify? under the full or partial rules? No. Just because your employees are under your customers at a stay at home order, that doesn't qualify you for the employee retention credit. What about restaurants? You know, they had a government order to close in room dining. Now takeout or delivery service is okay. Do you qualify for a partial, partially suspended operation? Yes, because according to the, gov the government order, mandated that you close or shut down your in-room dining service. Now you may have a question is what if I voluntarily did that on my own? If you did that before the government order, it, it doesn't count. You know, you need to be told by the government to shut down your, in this case, your dining service. These are just some steps to take for 2020. You probably, first you're gonna determine eligibility. You know, you have that partially or fully shut down or the gross receipts test. If you qualify for that, let's just move on to the next step, next step of qualified wages. And then do you want you if you were a PPP borrower, let's review that application, that forgiveness application and see kind of what we because we can pick and choose what wages. We're still learning about this ERC, this employee retention credit. So you know there's more information coming out, how to apply the application, you know, the, the nitty and gritty of it. So bear with us as we continue to learn how this ERC and its applicability. How to claim the credit. Typically you claim the credit on the form 941. It's those, remember those payroll quarterly reports that you file the month after the quarter. You could also claim it on the form 7200. It's like an advanced form. So if you know maybe in the month of January of 2021, 
you kind of have an idea that you qualify for the credit, you can request from the government an upfront refund. Now you then take half that, you, then when you get to the form, 90, the form 941, you kind of reconcile what you received, but what should have been, or so you potentially could get more credit or you'd have to pay it back. The Shuttered Venures Operations Grant, this is a new grant program with the with the SBA, administered by the SBA. If you have this kind of an issue, if you're a live venue operator, maybe a museum, a movie theater, a performing arts organization, you would then be eligible, potentially eligible for a grant. <laughs> it is administered by the SBA. As of last week, we're still awaiting guidance, but potential there's grant money up available. I did mention who's eligible. You got your live venue operators or promoters, producers, live performing arts operators, you know, zoos, aquariums, relevant muse museum operators, motion pictures such as movie theaters or talent reps. Just a, this slide and the next will give you some more a little what is a live venue operator or what's a relevant museum. Take a look at this. You know, you got your zoological parks, planetariums, aquariums. If you have an interest or you think you qualify, reach out to your trusted advisor and we can definitely help you out determine if you're eligible. Now, there are some requirements for this grant. You have to be fully operational on February 29th of 2020. Gross revenue during quarter one, two, three, or four was less than 75% of a comparable quarter to 2019. Can't be publicly traded. You know, if you the date of grant, maybe you were shut down that you intend to reopen. And finally, you cannot receive either any, either first round or second round of PPP money. At the, after December 27th, that is the date that the legislation. So if you receive money after December 27th, you know, either first or second round, you wouldn't be technically eligible for the grant. Now the use of the funds is pretty nice here. You have all the way until the end of this year to, to, to incur your expenses, payroll, mortgage, utilities, rents, independent contractors, but you can't use it for real estate purchases, lobbying, investing, or lending. All right. Second round stimulus payments. Well, a couple more minutes here. Um, as you know, 600 per family member includes dependent children, 16 years of under, years of age and under. There's going to be a phase out for singles. You know, there's a different phase out for head of households, a different for married filers. Now, potentially payments you've already received, it could have been electronically. Maybe a paper check is coming. That's going to take a little longer to get. Or there's a, a debit card that's coming out. So if you've got a debit card or you're looking in your mail, you've got a white envelope with the treasury seal on it. Don't throw that away. That's a debit card. Now, the treasury did say they're going to somehow reach out to people who have yet to cash I guess use their debit cards. Could have been from the first round loan or maybe the check. So how they're gonna reach out to you and it won't be by email, likely be by mail. So in the meantime, you know, definitely talk to your trusted advisor and discuss your situation and how these payments are gonna come. There is a tool oh, by the irs.gov site to see where your payment is. We definitely check that tool out to see kind of what's going on under if, if you have a payment or you're going to get a payment. There's some provisions on unemployment that was expanded to March 14th. Originally it was 600 per week. Now it's only 300. Educator expenses for those teachers out there. You know, the max deduction is at 250. Now they expanded some eligible expenses to include personal protection equipment, the unreimbursed side up to the 250 mark. 
If you recall back in October, uh, August of 2020, there was this deferral of employees portion of payroll. It was more of a deferral. And the repayment period is now through the end of December 31st of 2021. Charitable contribution for non itemizers a pretty big one this year. Cash only for 2020, if you contributed and you don't itemize to a nonprofit, you can take an above the line deduction for $300. Now for 2021 tax return, which is you know 12 months from now, married filers can get $600 above the line deduction, while others are at 300. Business meals for those business owners starting in calendar years 2021 or pretty much starting in 2021 and 2022, you can get a 100% now tax deduction for expenses paid incurred. You know, the meal is provided by a restaurant, takeout or delivery is okay. Finally, this rule does not apply for your 2020 tax returns. Now some of the provisions in the CARES Act that was not extended. I think this, Tony, is this yours? Uh, yes, Chris, this is where I'll jump in. Okay, thank you. So a few provisions on the retirement plan side. Um, unfortunately, the CARES Act provisions were not extended into 2021. Um, what that means is if your company did adopt those CARE Act provisions, uh, such as the loan uh, repayment uh, suspension, or the COVID distributions, those are no longer available um, in 2021. If your participants did get those suspended loans, they are going to need to resume making those paycheck, uh, those payments um, starting here in January 2021. So you want to make sure uh, that did happen. Otherwise, your plan could be found out of compliance. And that's going to create some other issues for you for those payments that were suspended. Um, they are going to need to calculate the interest due on those because uh, that did continue to accrue uh, while those payments were suspended. Um, in addition, for companies that had to uh, lay off part of the workforce, uh, the recently passed COVID stimulus did provide you a safe harbor. So as long as you are back to 80% of your active employment on March 13th, as compared to uh, the period ending on March 13th of 2020, uh, you won't be deemed to have a partial plan termination, uh, which is a good thing. Um, if you are found to have a partial plan termination, um, that means you have to make all participants fully vested, uh, which means any company money that they um, were given but had not earned based on the vesting schedule is now 100% vested and would go to them. Um, note that's based on headcount. You don't have to hire back the same employees. You just need to be at active, 80% uh, of active participation from your previous year. Disaster re relief was extended, but this is not a COVID provision, so it does not apply to uh, the national areas um, declared a COVID disaster. Uh, it really will only apply going forward to areas such as, as hurricane uh, disaster areas. Um, it increases the distribution loans amount up to 100,000 versus just 50,000 uh, with no penalty for it. Um, and it does allow the tax uh, liability to be spread over three years instead of immediate taxation. Um, and it can be paid back uh, to the qualified plan or the IRA over a three year period um, in order to um, get that money back in the account and recoup that uh, tax dollars. Money purchase plans. Uh, there are some legislations that clarified a few issues. Uh, most of our clients don't have that, so we'll gloss over this. If you do have questions, just please reach out. And then a couple additional retirement relief uh, packages that were in there. Um, there was a provision that allows certain construction and trade workers to collect retirement benefits at 55 and continue to work. Uh, this typically is related to uh, certain pensions. Um, they do have relief for pension transfers to cover future retiree costs within the pension plan. 
Um, and as Chris covered, uh, there were changes to that employee retention tax credit um, as it pertains to wages and benefits, including uh, your retirement plan contributions. We'll now open up the webinar to questions. Feel free to submit your questions into that Q&A chat feature, and we'll do our best to respond to all of them. Chris, it looks like we have a question from Stephanie. Um, 501c3 received forgiveness on our 213,000 PP loan. Still have EIDL of 10,000. Are you saying that this 10,000 uh, should be forgiven and I just need to watch my statements? Yes, that is right. That's All right, the EIDL. Stephanie, that Stephanie if you want to uh, expand on that question, feel free. Sorry, Chris, I interrupted you. No, oh, I just want to clarify. It's the advance economic or the EIDL advance of $10,000 that was, you know, back in the CARES Act provision. So. All right, thank you. Um, an anonymous uh, question was sent. If we qualify for shattered or shuttered grant, but we did receive PPP2 funds, could they be returned in full to qualify? As we are unaware of this until after application went through. I will have to say it's possible. I would reach out to your lender because you can return the, the PPP money, the round two money, and then apply for the shuttered venue. But I would definitely recommend reach out to your lender and discuss this option of returning, returning the proceeds. All right, that's it for the questions that we had in the Q&A. Um, if anyone has another question, feel free to submit those. And I do want to add here the email for COVID. It's misspelled, but it's COVID19 at criberrose.com. One more question here popped up in the Q&A. To be clear, we can pick and choose which wages to use for forgiveness and which wages to use for ERC with the 24 week window. Example, employee A hit the 2020 10,000 max for the time period outside of the 24 week. Uh, use, use more. Yeah, I think I understand what they were getting at. So yes, you can pick and choose. I do want to clarify that the employee retention credit, if you have related party concerns, you know, the related party wages are not eligible for the ERC. Now, just to clarify, if I was an owner of a business and I employed my children and I paid them wages, those wages paid to my kids would not be eligible for the employee retention credit. Yet they would still be eligible for the PPP, but to answer yes, originally just you can pick and choose, but just want to clarify the related issues with from a wage standpoint. It doesn't look like we have any more questions popping up in the Q&A. However, if you still have questions, feel free to reach out to Chris, Tony, or our COVID-19 team. All right, thank you for all attending. We do appreciate you spending your time with Kerberos today. We will provide you with a recording of this webinar and the presentation slides. Should you still have more questions, our presenters and the rest of our COVID team 
the Kerberos are more than willing to provide guidance on this topic and many others. You can also visit our COVID-19 resource page as well and check out the many helpful tools there to understand how COVID-19 might impact you and, or your organization. Thank you again. Make it a great day.